So it's my absolute privilege to introduce our next keynote. Um, I know I shouldn't play favourites with them, but I am in this instance because it's this man's work who actually um, 15 years ago inspired me to do my own PhD. Um, so I'm somewhat humbled to share a stage with him. Um, our keynote for this morning is Dr. Harrison Pope, who is Professor of Psychiatry at McLean Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Uh, he is, has authored more than 320 peer-reviewed papers on a wide range of topics in psychiatry, including work on psychotic disorders, major mood disorders, eating disorders, and substance abuse. Since the 1980s, Dr. Pope has taken a particular interest in the abuse of anabolic androgenic steroids. And he's published papers in the field of encompassed, encompassed the psychiatric effects of these substances, the associations of steroid use with male body image disorders, studies of the epidemiology of steroid use, and studies of the new, neuropsychiatric and medical consequences of long-term steroid exposure. He's presented findings of his research at numerous international scientific meetings, including now this one, and has also appeared in many popular media presentations and documentary films on this subject. Would you please welcome Dr. Harrison Pope. Now, this little device advances slides, and how do I go backwards? Forward, back, and that's if you need a pointer. And this is the pointer? Yep. Wonderful. So today I'm going to talk about what is arguably the most secret of all of the major forms of drug abuse, namely the abuse of anabolic androgenic steroids. <clears throat> the steroids, as most of you know, is a family of hormones <clears throat> that comprises testosterone, which is nature's original anabolic steroid, so to speak, and hundreds of synthetic derivatives of testosterone that have been created over the last 70 years. Uh, testosterone itself was first um, isolated in Nazi Germany in the 30s, and within a few years, many synthetic derivatives were quickly developed. By the 50s, uh, elite athletes had discovered that these drugs could allow them to gain muscle mass far beyond what any natural athlete could gain. The Russians were first busted with them in 1954 in the Vienna Weightlifting Championships. But steroids remained in the elite athletic community all the way up to about 1980 uh, in Olympians and elite bodybuilders. But it wasn't really until the 80s that steroids started to percolate out of the athletic community and onto the street, so to speak. Um, that began in the 80s in America. Here and in the UK, it was more in the 90s that you start to see widespread general population steroid use among ordinary rank and file gym clients. So this is a very young form of substance abuse that is just evolving even today. Um, one of the myths about steroids is that steroids are a problem of doping by athletes. Doping by athletes is only a small fraction of the total problem. Um, in the United States, where I just did an analysis uh, a few years ago, it's estimated that somewhere between three and four million American men have used these drugs at some time, and that about one million of these have developed a dependence syndrome on steroids, which I will describe in greater detail. But you can see that the number of professional athletes is diminutive by comparison with this massive group of ordinary steroid users who are not the people that you read about in the newspapers. So there are basically three myths about steroid use that I must address before going on. The first one I've just, I've just addressed, which is the idea that steroids are primarily a problem of competitive athletes. In fact, about 80% of anabolic steroid users in a number of studies uh, have reported that they have never used steroids for any competitive athletic purpose, that they are taking these drugs just to get big and mostly for personal appearance. A second myth, certainly that is prevalent in the United States, is that steroids are a problem of kids, of, of adolescents. Steroids are not an adolescent drug. The median age for starting steroids is about 23.5 years old, and less than 1% of steroid users have started to use these drugs by the time that they're 15. So this is not a high school adolescent drug. This is an adult drug. And because it's an adult drug, um, these are men in their 20s and 30s and 40s who aren't under the surveillance of teachers or coaches uh, and, and, or parents, and so they're hard to see. They go under the radar because we don't uh, have any way to count them particularly. 
Then the final myth is that girls and women often use steroids. In fact, in studies that have recruited steroid users without regard to gender, the ratio was about 98 to 2, about one, only about one out of every 50 steroid users is female. So throughout most of this talk, I'm going to be talking about men, uh, because it's really quite rare that you see female steroid users. So why do people take this stuff? Well, there's probably three ingredients that are necessary uh, to create the epidemic of steroid use that is now evolving. And the first of these ingredients is that these drugs really work. They are highly effective. This is Steve Reeves, who won the Mr. America contest in the year of my birth, 1947, uh, in the era before steroids were widely available. This was the most muscular man in the world in 1947. Any man who is as lean as this and who is more muscular than this and who claims that he got that way without drugs is lying. <laughs> here, by, here, by comparison, is a two-bit bodybuilder who couldn't even win the Mr. America contest today. He's got 30 kilogram, 20 to 30 kilograms more muscles than Steve Reeves, and it's all from drugs. Here's another example. Take a look at the, let me try a little pointer here. Take a look at the huge trapezius muscles there, and also the big deltoids. The steroids tend to selectively give hypertrophy of the upper body muscles, more so than the lower body muscles. And if you think about it, that's comparable to the difference between women and men. There are women who can run a marathon almost as fast as the leading men. But there is no woman who can hit an American baseball out of Fenway Park in Boston. And that's because men have this increased upper body musculature. So these drugs make you more male than male, so to speak, by, by causing hypertrophy of the upper muscles. A um, couple of other examples. Mr. America, 1939. He'd be lucky to be able to play sixth place on the Mr. Essex Con uh, county backup contest by modern standards. Uh, Mr. America, 1956, perfectly respectable looking, but dwarfed in comparison to a typical modern bodybuilder with a back like a manta ray. Uh, <clears throat> and also, steroids allow you to lose a great deal of body fat, so that with steroids you can get your body fat down to uh, 3%. So, the bottom line is, these drugs are highly effective. It is pointless for us to pretend to people that you can get this way with dedication and hard work. It's a matter of simple biology that you can exceed any natural limits with the use of these drugs. And kids in the gym know this. There's no point in trying to disguise this fact. But then there's a second ingredient that you need, and that is the emphasis on muscularity in our Western societies. Uh, this is something that has gone back for thousands of years, but has particularly gathered steam just in the course of the last three or four decades. And perhaps <clears throat> one of the most graphic examples of this is the evolution of little boys' action toys. Uh, this is what we call him G.I. Joe. I think that you call him Action Man. When G.I. Joe first appeared in 1964, as you can see, he was a perfectly ordinary looking dude. If he was my size, he'd have maybe a 13 inch bicep, 37 inch chest. But by 1975, you can see that his counterpart has already started to put in a little time in the gym. Uh, and by 1992, you can see that he's not only putting in time in the gym, but maybe he's been slipping a little bit of juice on the side uh, and has you know, sculpted abdominals, a 16 and a half inch arm, uh, and, and has gotten dramatically more muscular. And the same evolution um, is even more striking with the miniature GI Joes that first came on the market in 1982. So on the left, we have the little GI Joe grunt, who is a perfectly ordinary looking soldier. By 1991, he has become strikingly more muscular. And by 1997, we have the G.I. Joe Extreme, whose biceps are practically bigger than his waist. Uh, and the same, the same evolution is evident in other toys. For example, here's Luke Skywalker. When Star Wars first came out in 1977, Luke was a perfectly ordinary looking kid, 
Whereas 20 years later, when Star Wars was reissued, he has acquired the body of a bodybuilder. It's even said that, that Mark Hamill, who played Luke Skywalker, uh, upon picking up the 1997 version of himself, is said to have exclaimed, good God, they put me on steroids. Uh, Han Solo, similarly, has evolved from uh, an ordinary looking man to a muscular figure. And we see this everywhere in our society. We are assaulted with pictures of muscular male bodies on magazines, at checkout counters, and cartoons, and advertisements, and television, and drama, everywhere. You just can't grow up without seeing them. Um, who would think of using a muscular body to advertise liqueurs, uh, or to advertise cellular telephones, or ironing boards? Uh, 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 and here's, here's an advertisement from a, a magazine that was in the seat back pocket of an airplane recently. It's an ad for negotiating seminars, uh, where you learn to be an effective negotiator. And they say that going to one of these seminars is like steroids for your career. Now, I don't think this ad would be su so successful if it said, this is like heroin for your career, <laughs> or this is like cocaine for your career. That steroids get a, get a positive spin. Uh, we, we don't see them as, as negatively as other drugs, even though they are other drugs, plain and simple. Here's another ad from, for giant post-it notes. Um, think, think of it as a post-it note on steroids. Once again, if you said, think of it as a post-it note on marijuana, the sales probably would not be so successful. So we have this, this tradition of muscularity um, fueled by corporate advertising uh, that has permeated Western society so that kids growing up see images like this, which constantly say that muscularity is masculinity, that muscularity is, is something that you should aspire to. And I would submit that this tradition goes back for thousands of years. You only have to think of a Greek statue uh, made thousands of years ago where muscularity was already being worshipped. This is the uh, uh, drawing made by the famed Italian anatomist Bernardino Genga back in the late 1700s, and it's a drawing of the Farnese statue of Her Heracles, which is in the museum in Naples. And uh, Genga has actually added more musculature even beyond that of the original statue. And this, this drawing, made 250 years before the discovery of anabolic steroids, has an eerie similarity to a modern competition bodybuilder. Um, and the tradition of muscularity in strongmen is arguably even greater in Scandinavia, with its tradition of the Norse gods and Thor and Vulcan and the Vikings. And interestingly, Scandinavia probably has the worst steroid problem in the world. Uh, it, there, there's more steroid use in Scandinavia than there is here or, or in the United States or other British Commonwealth countries. This is a painting, hangs in London by Fusli, of Thor battering the Midgard serpent. And not only does Thor have the body of a bodybuilder, but even his boatman, Hymir, who's fast asleep in the bow of the boat, has a complete six pack of abdominals and huge shoulders and everything. By comparison, if you look at art from the Far East, well, there's none of this tradition of muscularity. <clears throat> this is a scroll from, from the Museum of Fine Arts in my hometown of Boston, showing the god, god and goddess Izanagi and Izanami raising the island of Japan out of the Pacific. They're fully clothed, no added musculature, nothing comparable to our Western muscular tradition. Here's a wooden statue, one of the oldest wooden statues in the world from a shrine outside of Kyoto uh, of a male deity. Once again, fully clothed, no additional muscle, uh, nothing comparable to what we have in the West. And therefore, it's not surprising that anabolic steroid use is widespread in the West, but you never see steroid users in Japan or, or China um, or other Far Eastern countries. More so in, in Southeast Asia, yes, but not in the Far East. And part of this is because in Eastern tradition, in Confucian tradition, a masculine man is a man who has intellect, who has force of character, who has integrity. It's not a big Rambo muscular hunk. So culture uh, is another critical ingredient um, in this combination of factors that has led 
to widespread steroid use. But then there's one third critical ingredient, and that's body image disorder. Um, one of the things that became noticeable to me when I first started doing research in this field 30 years ago was <clears throat> that a number of these men would have what I termed reverse anorexia nervosa. That, as you know, women with anorexia nervosa will look at themselves in the mirror and see themselves as fat, even though they may actually weigh only 87 pounds. <clears throat> and many of my guys in my study saw themselves as being much more small and puny, even though they were actually large and muscular. And these body image concerns drive people to using steroids as the, as the solution to their problem. About five years ago, <clears throat> I did a study where we recruited a couple of hundred guys from uh, experienced weightlifters from local gyms, comprising about 102 steroid users and 133 otherwise similar men who had never used steroids. And we asked them about body image cons uh, preoccupations that they had when they were young adolescents before trying steroids. And as you can see from these Kaplan-Meier curves here, the, the men who were in the upper 50% of body image concerns, shown in red, were much more likely to descend into steroid use as the years went by, whereas those with lower levels of body image concern were much less likely to develop steroid use with advancing years. So uh, underlying body image considerations uh, are obviously a powerful factor. This difference on this thing is significant at well beyond the 001 level uh, as, as a factor, as a major risk factor for subsequent anabolic steroid use. So uh, the cocktail of ingredients that is necessary is the efficacy of these drugs, our Western social climate with its emphasis on muscularity, and the presence of individuals who have some of the underlying pathology that responds to this and, and drives them to consider using steroids. So why should we be worried about this? What, what, what is the cause for concern? Well, the first thing is that an astonishing 30% of steroid users go on to develop a dependence syndrome. Now think about all the other drugs that you guys have been hearing about over the course of this conference. What other drug does 30% of the people who use the drug develop dependence on it? And the reason for this very high dependence rate is that it's sort of a triple threat. Number one, if you have body image disorder and you gain a whole lot of muscle, you're going to start getting terrified that if you stop your steroids, that all that muscle will wither away and it keeps you drive, drives you to continue using them. Number two, as, as I will discuss later, steroids suppress the body's own natural production of testosterone. And so if you take steroids for a long time and then you stop, your own testosterone level will fall almost to zero, and there'll be a huge temptation to resume taking the steroids to make the bad feelings go away. And third, interestingly enough, steroids have a, a hedonic quality. They, they, they have a reward quality. If you take male hamsters, and you put them in a cage where they can inject themselves with testosterone, with a nose poke, the male hamsters will self-inject testosterone to the point of death. Uh, and interestingly, if you pre-treat those mice with naloxone, they won't get addicted to testosterone, suggesting that testosterone and opiates are tickling something in the same place, presumably in the nucleus accumbens, uh, and, and have some crossover. So there's a number of pathways that tend to lead to dependent syndromes, and there is where you start to see the problem. The short-term effects of these drugs are pretty modest, but the long-term effects in dependent individuals who have been taking them for uh, months and years of time uh, can be very considerable. And we are only beginning to understand the magnitude of those effects today. So if I were to rank the things that scare me the most. Uh, number one would have to be the cardiovascular effects. Uh, and, and I'm going to present you results of our recent study of that. The second is hypogonadism, loss of natural testosterone production. I'd rank number three probably as the psychiatric disorders, which are uncommon, but when they do happen, they can be pretty bad. And then finally, the real wild card, which we're just starting to investigate now at Harvard, is the possibility of neurotoxicity. So taking these in order, um, steroids affect muscles. 
The heart is a muscle. It is, in fact, the strongest muscle in the body, and it's the only muscle that never rests. And in steroid users, it is not uncommon to see a so-called cardiomyopathy. And the way that you, that you do this is with, with echocardiography, which is like an ultrasound, where the machine can actually see the vessels of the heart, and you can calculate uh, how effectively the heart is pumping out blood, and then how effectively it's filling back, back up with blood in between the beats. Here is an echocardiographic tracing. On the top, a non-steroid user. As you can see in the right-hand peak, all of the different aspects of the ventricular muscle are all contracting in a nice, coherent uh, way. Uh, and as you can see with the red highlighted ring on the left-hand side, uh, the, the uh, contraction is, is a strong, coherent contraction. On the bottom, we have an otherwise comparable steroid user. And as you can see there, the different aspects of the ventricular muscle are not contracting coherently. The overall impact of the beat is substantially less, and uh, that's dramatically illu illustrated with the color-enhanced ring on the left. So that what happens is that the ventricle can't force out enough blood. Uh, in other words, the, what is known as the left ventricular ejection fraction uh, that, that occurs during systole is considerably compromised. But then there's another problem, and that is when the heart tries to fill back up with blood in between the beats. Uh, on the top, we have a non-steroid user. And as you can see, there's high peaks and deep valleys there. And that is because the ventricle is soft and rubbery, and it fills back up efficiently with blood ready for its next beat. On the bottom, a steroid user. Much less, uh, peak, fewer peaks and valleys. And that's because the ventricle is too stiff it, it doesn't have the flexibility that it's supposed to have, possibly because of fibrosis that has accumulated in the myocardium. So that the ventricle does not fill up as efficiently, um, and that in turn compromises the efficiency of the heart to, in beating. So we got a five-year grant from the National Institute of Drug Abuse uh, a while ago, and I have just finished publishing the results of this study, where I looked at 86 long-term steroid users who had logged at least two years of lifetime steroid exposure, 54, and 54 non-steroid using bodybuilders who also had years of experience in the gym but reported never having taken steroids. And if you look, if you look at the steroid users overall, right, uh, if you look at the steroid users overall, you can see that, that uh, perhaps half of them fall below the normal threshold of 55%. But what is interesting is that the guys who were actually taking steroids at the time that we studied them were almost all, a very large fraction of them, had too little ability to pump blood out when the ventricle contracted. Whereas the ones who were off steroids, who, who were in between steroid cycles, had largely recovered and were almost on a par with the brown box, which is the non-steroid users. Although there were still some who still had deficits even after stopping the steroids. And then this one is the ability of the ventricle to fill back up with blood. Once again, the guys who were currently taking steroids, a lot of them, the ventricle was too slow in filling back up with blood, showing that it was, that it was stiff and not flexible enough. Again, you see some recovery in the ones who had gone off steroids. But even then, their, their average level of, of uh, ventricular filling was still markedly below that of the non-steroid users in the brown box. So steroids clearly impair <coughs> both <coughs> the systolic and the diastolic function of the heart. Some of that recovers when you stop your steroids, but it doesn't all recover, especially the stiffness of the ventricle. Um, and in extreme cases, could lead to congestive heart failure. But what is probably even more worrisome than that is atherosclerotic disease. What we did also with these guys was to put them in the CT scanner and give them a shot of contrast agent. And the scanner can watch the contrast agent as it goes shooting through the blood vessels. And so it can actually see like a little piece of, of uh, hardening of the arteries, of so-called atherosclerotic plaque forming in the arteries. <coughs> 
And <clears throat> when we calculated the amount of, of this atherosclerotic plaque that had uh, developed in these guys, we found that there was a highly significant correlation between the total lifetime duration of steroid exposure and the degree of atherosclerosis. And you can see that it starts to get particularly striking when you get up to around 10 years of lifetime steroid use. And that is not uncommon, uh, that, that these guys will start taking steroids in their 20s. They'll initially take you know, a, a cycle of four months of steroids, and then they'll go off for four to six months and then go back on. But pretty soon, the cycles get closer and closer together, and the next thing you know, they're taking steroids continuously without any interruptions. And it's not hard to accumulate a total of 10 years of exposure doing that. Um, of the 86 men that I recruited for this cardiac study, three of the 86 men had already had heart attacks at the ages of 38, 42, and 46, respectively. Uh, so that uh, I would predict that we will see more uh, heart attacks, strokes, and, and other evidence of, of uh, atherosclerotic disease as the years go by. So number two on my list, which I've already alluded to, is hypogonadism. So if you're male, as are 98% of steroid users, and you're taking testosterone or another steroid, your hypothalamus in your brain looks around and says, well, gee, we've, we've got tons of steroids already coming in. There's no need to manufacture any more. So your hypothalamus tells your pituitary to shut down and stop making its two hormones, uh, luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone. And that, in turn, tells your testis to fall asleep. And the testis stops manufacturing testosterone and stops manufacturing sperm cells. So then, if you stop your steroids, especially if you stop your steroids after a year or a prolonged period of using them, the testis has shrunk to half its original size. It's in no shape to be able to start manufacturing testosterone. And it takes months and sometimes years for the testis to come back online. And our recent data suggests that in a fair number of people, that it may be irreversible, that, that some of these guys are walking around with grossly reduced testosterone levels even a couple of years after their last exposure to steroids. So this, again, is a problem. If, if you had asked me 10 years ago, I would have assured you that this was not a big deal. And I was totally wrong, uh, that this, this is surprisingly common. And of course, one of the effects of this is that men want to go back on the steroids right away because otherwise they have no sex drive, they have terrible erectile function, and sometimes they have depression. So number three on my list is the psychiatric disorders. Fortunately, the psychiatric disorders are fairly rare. They're, they're not very common, but when they do happen, they can be pretty bad. <clears throat> and they consist of hypomanic episodes during the time that you're taking the steroids and then depressive episodes during steroid withdrawal. Uh, the manic episodes typically occur in people who are taking pretty high doses. Uh, in this graph, a high dose is defined as more than 1,000 milligrams of testosterone a week. Uh, so for comparison purposes, the natural output, output of the male testis is around 60 milligrams per week. So these are guys taking about 20 times the natural amount of testosterone. And about a quarter of them had experienced a manic or hypomanic episode characterized by euphoria, irritability, uh, aggressiveness, and sometimes violence. And in extreme cases of this case, the violence can be pretty serious. Uh, this is a case where I was an expert witness about 25 years ago of a 16-year-old kid in the Boston area who had been a shy, milk-toast personality, never heard a fly, went on anabolic steroids and murdered his 16-year-old girlfriend with a kitchen knife. Um, and then many of you probably remember Anton Breivik, uh, who uh, was a terrorist who killed 86 people in Norway in the summer of 2011. And in Breivik's 1,500-page internet manifesto, he actually describes how he purchased the steroids, the exact combination of steroids that he took, uh, how he got them imported into Norway, carefully disguised to elude the customs officials, and so on. Um, the depressive episodes, again, are uncommon. Only about 10% of people get them. And we have no idea why. Uh, for some reason, 90% of people uh, recover pretty easily in terms of mood, but a small number can get severely depressed and even suicidal 
coming off steroids for, re for some sort of biological reason that is not yet known to science. And finally, this is the wild card, is the neurotoxic effects. It was found out about 10 years ago that if you expose human brain cells to very high levels of testosterone in a petri dish in the lab, that they will die prematurely. And the investigators who did this study speculated that perhaps bodybuilders and other high-dose steroid users being exposed to these levels for months and years of time might be at risk for developing the early onset of a dementia um, as a result of loss of brain cells. And we did a pilot study of this um, in Middlesbrough, England, where we rounded up 22 long-term steroid users um, and a, a smaller number of, of shorter-term users, and then a group of weightlifters reporting no steroid use, and gave them a battery of cognitive tests of memory, verbal memory, powers of attention, uh, continuous performance tests, et cetera. And on most of the tests, there was not a difference. But on visual spatial memory, the steroid users were markedly impaired relative to the non-users. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to show this very quickly. But the computer, for example, will show you a series of a dozen little patterns. And then after seeing them all, the computer will show you two of them side by side and ask you to point out which one of those did you see before. And then in a similar test, uh, and, and the steroid users made far more mistakes on that. And then there's another one where there's six boxes. And underneath each of the white boxes is a little squiggle. And each of the boxes opens up to show you the squiggle. And then at the end, when the squiggle is presented, I have to remember uh, which box it had appeared in. And uh, again, the steroid users made more mistakes. But what was particularly concerning was that the performance on, this, on the first of the two tests, so-called pattern recognition memory, was highly correlated with the degree of total lifetime steroid exposure at the 0.002 level. So that the longer you'd been taking steroids, the worse you did on this, on this test. And we had normalized data for the United Kingdom on this particular test so that we could translate the results into the equivalent of an IQ uh, with a median of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. And applying that, these guys were losing about 1.5 visual spatial IQ points per year of steroid use. So that if you'd log 10 years of, of high dose steroid exposure, your IQ level on this test would be down to 85. So this is really quite, quite an alarming finding. It has not been replicated systematically, um, but uh, it's something that, that has to be pursued. Similar findings on the test with the white boxes. And then, more recently, we got a bunch of uh, guys in the United States and put them in the MRI machine and did magnetic resonance spectroscopy where you can measure the levels of different neurochemicals in the brain. And this little baby right there, SI, siloinositol, was down to about half of what it was supposed to be in the steroid users. And siloinositol protects you against Alzheimer's disease. It, it helps to detoxify beta amyloid, which is the culprit in Alzheimer's disease. And if you don't have enough of it, that's a, that's a potential risk factor. So fortunately, we just, just by the skin of our teeth, we finally got a grant for another two million bucks to do a five-year study uh, of this, where we're going to be giving detailed cognitive testing and uh, a, a lot of neuroimaging, two hours in the MRI machine, to a group of steroid users in comparison, non-users. And if you invite me back here at about 2021, I'll tell you what happens. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it, it's, it's a little scary. So in conclusion, the problem here is that steroid use is such a recent phenomenon that we're only now just beginning, just beginning to get an idea of, of the full magnitude of the long-term effects of these drugs. Uh, because if you figure that um, the great majority of the world's steroid users um, all started after the 1980s and, and in Australia and Britain after the 1990s, even the oldest members of this cohort, guys who started taking steroids in, say, 1991 when they were, say, 23 years old, they are only now reaching middle age and entering the age of risk for these various complications. So it's only now that we're beginning to be able to study this, and one wonders about what is going to happen 
over the next 10 years as more and more of these people advance into middle age. Um, so um, the, the key is the leading edge of this population, uh, the, of this aging population of steroid users. And to give you an idea, let me just propose to you an analogy. Suppose that widespread cigarette smoking had not existed in Australia until the 1990s, and that the vast majority of Australia's cigarette smokers were under the age of 50 today, uh, as is the case with steroids. If that were the case, there'd be the occasional report in the scientific literature of uh, lung cancer, uh, the occasional small case series of emphysema, but we'd have no idea of what was about to hit us. And what worries me is that an analogous situation may exist for the millions of individuals who have taken these drugs, and that over the next decade, we're going to start to see a lot more of this pathology um, as, as Mother Nature begins to take its toll. Thank you. Thank you.